Hello, I'm Stefan Kreber, Project Leader for LexDay, and today I'd like to go through a pretty new feature of LexDay, uh, first introduced in LexDay 5.5 and then further expanded in LexDay 5.6. Uh, I already went through some of that in the release live streams, but I figured uh, a dedicated video would be better to go over it. That feature is the uh, new object storage slash storage bucket feature of LexDay, which allows uh, anyone to use a mostly S3 compatible storage API on an LXT everywhere. Um, it's supported both on local storage pools, so that means on top of things like the directory storage backend, or RFS, ZFS, LVM, as well as uh, on top of Ceph. The actual implementation in those two cases is different. Uh, when dealing with the local case, we are using a third-party project called Minio uh, that is then run on a effectively per bucket basis uh, by LexD using a bit of a shim proxy. But effectively, we're using Minio to provide the API. We did not re-implement the S3 API. On the Ceph side, we are using the built-in Rados gateway in Ceph that then provides an S3 compatible API on top of the Ceph object, object storage layer. So that's effectively what we have as far as how this is built. Now, as to why you might want that. Well, it's really, you know, like LexD for a while, we've been trying to offer effectively a full cloud experience, but locally, uh, either on your own system, standalone, or on a small scale cluster. And part of what public clouds offer is object storage. Uh, that can be used sometimes to just store backups or to store larger objects that insert uh, from a website or even sometimes host an entire website. What you do with it, um, we don't really know. Um, and LexD doesn't really care. It's just an S3 compatible API that you can then use to store and retrieve whatever you want. Um, on, the, on the LexD side, as far as access uh, to it, First thing to mention is that it's not limited to LXT instances. You can totally run that and then access it from any other machine on your network. The access token and everything are completely separate from the rest of the LXT API. So you do need to have access to the LXT API to create the buckets, but not to then consume them. And so you can totally have systems uh, that are outside of LXT accessing buckets that are hosted by LXT. Obviously, we think most of our users will be consuming those buckets from within LexD instances. That's why it probably makes the most sense, um, but it's not restricted to that. Now, the other thing as far as access control is that there are two different levels of access that's uh, supported by LexD. One, which is the admin level that allows um, doing everything you want, effectively some amount of reconfiguration, uh, writing to the buckets, renaming things, moving things around. In some cases, even doing uh, some amount of additional access control uh, through that. And the other level of access with support is plain read-only. Um, like, by default, like, they will create admin credentials only, but you can go ahead and then create additional read-only credentials if you want to. You can create additional admin credentials as well. Uh, the usual use case for that being you can effectively create a pair of credentials per application and then use it that way, making it a lot easier to revoke uh, keys if needed. Other than that, I've got the documentation open here, but there's not a ton of configuration really or exposed at this point. Uh, the storage buckets can have a size configured, which then uses LexD's existing quota mechanism to, to apply those. Uh, you can set uh, any kind of user configuration keys on top of it. There's some uh, support for growing buckets, but not shrinking them, or at least it depends on the underlying storage, whether it's possible to shrink or not. Um, the different keys and how to manage keys. And that's pretty much it. Everything else you can do through normal S3 clients, uh, as we'll see in the demo part of this. And it's really meant to be compatible with the vast majority of software that just puts and gets stuff from S3. Uh, if you're dealing with something that's making extensive use of the Amazon specific S3 API, uh, whether it's like setting up some very complicated policies or uh, dealing with the different users, that kind of stuff, that might not work because, uh, well, even Minio doesn't implement everything that's possible as far as uh, the, the Amazon API itself. 
I think we've got a decent subset uh, that should work with most uh, most workloads. And it's also worth noting that like this is very similar to what what Ceph offers in this case through Redis Gateway, but also uh, Google Storage and a bunch of others that offer S3 compatible endpoints, um, but that are not like fully. Um, well, don't support all of the newer features of S3. All right, uh, so let's go take a look at this thing. Switching here over to my desktop machine. We're going to be looking uh, initially with just the storage, uh, the local storage case. So if I look at my storage pools here, I've got a default storage pool using ZFS and I've got a remote storage pool on Ceph here. Um, so if you just want to use your on local storage pool, you don't really need to do any kind of advanced setup. There's just one thing you need to do, which is configuring configuring a IP address for that particular server. So it is on core storage buckets address, and you need to set that to the address you want Lexd to listen on for the S3 API. In this case, I'm going to use uh, a IPv4 address in my system and some random port. You said that, at which point LexD will listen on that address, and that's what you're going, to, you're going to be using for S3 access. The, the S3 API is not exposed to the main API listener in LexD. Then you can create a bucket. So storage bucket create, which is very analogous to how we've got storage volume create. In this case, it's storage bucket create. Uh, then you pick the storage pool. So default in this case, we'll call it foo. And you could just go like that, or you can um, set some limits. So let's say we do 10 gigs. And here we go. The search bucket has been created. We have the admin key pair printed here uh, for convenience. You can also go look at it with show, which then shows you the 10 gigs, uh, shows you the ZFS config that was done behind the scenes, as well as the S3 URL to access it. Then if you want to look at the keys, you can do key list and then default foo, which then shows the admin key. And you can do show on the admin key which gets you back the same uh, as was printed during creation time. So great, you've got a bucket. Now, how do you interact with it? Well, that's where uh, we've got to use a separate tool. In this case, I'm going to be using S3 CMD, but there are a bunch of others. So it's an S3 client uh, in the command line in this case. And I'm going to use it directly from my machine. I'm not even going to bother using a LXD instance for any of this because it would work the same way. So I might as well just run it from the host. Um, so we're going to be using S3CMD, the put command. I've got a small file called foo.img uh, here. We want to push it over the S3 API to a bucket which is called foo. And then we need to, because it's not actual Amazon S3, we want to tell it, tell it where the server is. So that's going to be host with 1.217.251 on 8555. And uh, same thing for the bucket itself. I need to repeat the exact same thing followed by the access key. So the access key is this one. And then followed by the secret key, which is that one. And because it's going to be TLS and uh, I don't want to bother setting up certificates and everything right now, I'm just going to do no check certificate. OK. Uh, and I guess it's access underscore key. So let's just go and fix that. Okay, and here we go. So uh, because of the chunk sizing and everything in S3, uh, quite often file transfers get split into chunks. So in this case, my file uh, was chunk was cut into seven pieces of about 15 megs each. Actually, see the first six were 15 megs, last one was 10 megs. The total transfer speed was around 260 megabytes per second. And yeah, the file has been pushed. It's about a 100 megabytes file that's now inside of that S3 bucket. If we want to retrieve it, we can do the same thing. So instead we do get, I'm going to remove the file name from here. From the foo bucket, we want foo.img and download it as foo1.img. And we're done. Downloaded at right around 500 megabytes per second this time. foo1.img file is back here. And if we actually make sure that the source and destination are the same. Yay, all good. So that's for the local use case. Um, if you want to create additional keys, for example, um, so there was the list here, you can do create default foo. And then if you look, you could set a specific access key or secret key or not. 
uh, by default, creating an additional key will just have it be read only. So if we call the key RO, for example, and go look at what we have on there, we can see a new key here that's marked as read only. Um, if we want to create a new admin, can do admin one, role admin. And here we go. Uh, you can set a description on them uh, through edit. So that would be edit here. So if we do there, can do a description, my application, save that. And here we go. So that's for the local case. Uh, that gets you this. If we actually go look at what's running, min IO. We see the Minio process running here. Uh, LexD is being pretty smart about it. We effectively run a proxy in front of um, those Minio instances. They get spawned on demand and kept around for a little while. And then LexD will terminate them so that there's no waste of CPU or memory when you're not actually using your bucket. And that's it for the local case. So now let's take a look at the remote case. As mentioned, uh, Ceph is a bit of a different beast. That's because you don't really want to run main.io on top of a Ceph RBD volume, uh, like we could technically do here. Uh, that'd be a bit weird. So we don't actually allow that. Uh, if you do a bucket create remote foo, it's going to tell you that this storage pool does not support buckets. Instead, what you need to do is define a new storage pool. Uh, so let's call it remote dash object in this case, and using the Ceph object backend driver. And then you need to set the endpoint. Um, for the S3 API. So that you need to figure out on the Ceph side. It's usually the, the address of your host. Uh, it could be HTTPS if you're going through Nginx or something like that, otherwise it's HTTP. So you set uh, that Ceph object, Rados gateway endpoint address as part of the cre pool creation. And once it's created, if you look at your list, now you've got a new pool here called remote object that can actually create buckets. So now if we were, if we do the creation again, for foo within remote object. There we go. Get a key. And if we do show on this thing, you can see here the S3 endpoint for it. And then the same thing, slightly different actually uh, for the syntax for the S3 CMD to deal with it. Um, but let's put uh, foo.img again. Then I push that again to a um, object, well, to a bucket called foo. The host is going to be this dude there. And then the host for bucket is the same thing. And then the access key is this one. The secret key is that one. And there's no SSL in this case. We need to pass no SSL. Same thing, it's chunking it into seven chunks and pushing that over the API. It's a bit small, a bit slower this time. You can see just like 25 megabytes per second. That's because it's going out to, well, anywhere between 25 and 30, actually. Um, it's going to a remote self pool that's replicated and everything. So that's going to be a bit slower than your local storage on NVMe. Then to retrieve it, same deal as earlier. We do get instead S3 foo and then foo.img and only that's foo1.img. And here we go. The retrieval went way faster um, because, well, we don't need to deal with the replication. If anything, Ceph actually works in our favor by, letting, by being able to pull from multiple machines in one shot to transfer this very quickly. Um, also, my desktop is connected on 10 gigabit, uh, which allows for those kind of speeds. On your local system, it's, well, if you're connected over Wi Fi or something uh, to a Ceph cluster, it's going to be significantly slower, obviously. And that's it. I mean, the rest works the same way. You can cr all create the keys the exact same way. Uh, so if we just do a key list, and we look at remote object, we're going to see that this is completely identical. It's using two completely different backends. The local case is Minio. The remote case is using the Cypher gateway. But to the user, there's no difference. Uh, LexD makes it look completely identical. Um, and yeah, the exact subset of S3 that's supported by one or the other differs, but for what the majority of applications will use, which is just pushing stuff, getting stuff, listing stuff, uh, that will work the exact same way. And that is it. Uh, that's a look at our object storage feature in Nexty. Um, 
specifically looking at both uh, local and store uh, local and remote storage in the same video. As I mentioned, this was introduced in Next 5.5 where we did the safe part and then next D5.6 did the local storage part. Um, so this one was a good opportunity to go through all of it and also go into slightly more details around the access control configuration and all of that kind of stuff. So hopefully it's going to be useful to you. Um, I like, especially if you're running any kind of application that does support uh, S3 based st storage, that might be something to consider. Uh, you'll want to do some amount of testing around performance and that kind of stuff in in some cases for some specific kind of workloads this can be a good way to boost your performance uh, also by not having your application itself serve those kind of assets but having that be delegated to another server um, so yeah have fun play with it if you've got any questions leave them down below uh, or go to our community forum and i'll see you in the next one thanks bye